Hello, everybody. Welcome back as we explore the earliest members of our genus. So in our last lecture, <clears throat> excuse me, we met some of our common ancestors, potentially Australopithecus afarensis, um, and other hominins that were surviving in Africa at the time that simply went extinct, like the Paranthropus genus. In this lecture, we're going to look at two species, Homo habilis and Homo erectus, so that you can complete your early Homo lab. Now, um, I want to make a quick point about the debate on hominin taxonomy. So we are members of the genus Homo, but there is a little bit of controversy as to how many species there are. And, and this is actually what a lot of your early Homo lab is all about. Um, there are kind of two major trains of thought that uh, one is that a lot of these fossils can be classified as distinct species, which means that they would not have been able to interbreed uh, easily. The other train of thought is that a lot of these fossils are simply just variations of a, a single species. Um, and you will have a chance to look at some of those examples and come up with your own opinion. For instance, we're going to look at Homo habilis, which translates to handyman, a species that appears in the fossil record about 2.5 million years ago and then is gone from the fossil record about 1.2 million years ago. They were first discovered um, by the uh, famous paleontological family, uh, the Leakeys, Mary and Louis Leakey in Tanzania, which is Eastern Africa, in 1906. But notice that there are other taxonomic names. So um, you may find that some scientists will take uh, uh, all of the Homo habilis fossils and actually break them into different species. Some think that they are primitive enough to be called Australopithecus habilis. Some think that some of the Homo habilis fossils are so much more advanced than the others that they deserve their own species called Homo rudolfensis. Um, we'll look at some samples of these and you will decide for yourself in the lab. Some Homo habilis traits. So notice that the primitive traits, the traits that they retain from their ancestors are ape-like limb proportions, meaning that the um, arms of Homo habilis were still relatively long. They were also very short with sexual dimorphism. So the males were about four feet and the females were about three feet. But the advancing traits, the traits where they're moving, um, you know, the, the, some of these more derived traits are an increase in brain size. So we go from about a 440 cubic average uh, centimeter average in Australopithecines to about a 610 cubic centimeter average in Homo habilis. This is one of the biggest jumps. That's a 40% increase in brain volume. The skull, you may note, is also more rounded um, than we see among Australopithecus. The brow ridge is much lighter, um, and the prognathism is reduced. The teeth are also smaller, and there's more of a parabolic arch among Homo habilis than its ancestors among the Australopithecines. Now, Homo habilis also had another advancing trait, and that is wide finger pads. Um, the tips of their fingers, the bones in the tips of their fingers, were wider than we see among Australopithecines and apes, which we um, associate with their increased ability in manipulating tools. So let's look at an example of an early uh, Homo habilis. This is KNMER 1813, um, a 1.7 million year old Homo habilis fossil. Um, this is a 500 cubic uh, centimeter brain size, so smaller than the average. We see a slightly pronounced brow, but a smaller and less uh, you know, a smaller prognathic face. Notice that you have um, a nice uh, post-orbital constriction here as well. Now this sample is KNM ER1470, same, same age, 1.7 million years old, but significant differences between the two. So the brain size here is 750 to 800. That's, that's nearly double what we see of the 1813 cranium. There's also no, almost no brow ridge here, and the face is larger and longer and flatter than the 1813 virgin. So when you're looking at samples in your lab this week, what you want to do is 
use descriptive terminology in the charts where you're comparing the fossil samples I gave you. Um, so where the, excuse me, the row says brow ridge. If you had 1813, you might say uh, thick brow ridge, where in 1470, thin or minimal brow ridge. Um, you know, length of face, size of cranium, you want to use comparative terms. And ultimately, you're going to decide for yourself, are the differences big enough that these two specimens deserve to have different species names? Just a quick little bit of information about what life was like for Homo habilis. Um, they uh, were generally believed to be our first tool users until we found some tools among the Australopiths. Um, but Homo habilis has a unique tool tradition called the Oldowan tool tradition with cores and flakes. And they used a method of tool making called percussion flaking where they took a hammer stone um, and then a core stone and they cracked that hammer stone against the core in a percussion method, um, in a pattern percussion method, in, in order to get a sharp flake edge, which could then be used to scrape a little bit of meat off of the bones or perhaps dig or cut tendons to be used for all sorts of things. So this is the tradition that's associated with Homo habilis. It's not very advanced, um, especially considering the technology we have today, but it is a method that is consistent, that's patterned, and that's indicative of culture among Homo habilis. Um, the tools that they're using uh, seem to be for both gathering plant foods and butchering animals, but keep in mind that these are absolutely not hunters. Um, they have no hunting weapons, they're relatively slow on two feet, and they're not on four feet, um, and so they're probably just scavengers, meaning that they are taking whatever the leftovers are of the animals left behind by predators. Uh, the sexual dimorphism that they have suggests that they were group living. If you remember from our primate behavior discussion, um, sexual dimorphism is usually reflective of females selecting certain male traits um, in or because that male is caring for multiple females and multiple children at a single time. Homo habilis also had what we call repeat use sites. So not only were they um, using a repeat use site in order to... Um, uh, make their tools, which is where we found the Oldowan tools in the Olduvai Gorge. But they also appeared to be potentially butchering the uh, scavenged animals that they found in separate areas, which is an intelligent thing to do because, of course, we don't want to bring our meat where we live. It's going to attract predators. As we move along the evolutionary line, we meet Homo erectus, which translates to erect man. Um, and this species appears as early as 1.8 million years ago. And we have a question mark here. Um, were they around as, as, as early as 35,000 years ago? There's a little bit of debate um, up for that here as well. Now, the first Homo erectus was discovered by Eugene Dubois in Indonesia in 1891, which is a huge discovery because this would be the first fossil to be found outside of Africa. Um, and Homo erectus is the first species to leave Africa. Now, much like we will do in the lab with Homo habilis, Homo erectus also has a very wide range of samples and a lot of diversity. And so sometimes um, some paleoanthropologists have argued that there's enough difference between these samples that we may actually break them down into more species. Um, so some paleoanthropologists believe that um, there are three species here, Homo ergaster, Homo erectus for the Asian samples, and Homo antecessor for the European samples. Again, in your lab, you will make the decision as to whether or not you think there are big enough differences between the three uh, samples provided that they should be uh, identified as three separate species. So let's start just generally with Homo erectus traits. What are some of the primitive traits they retain from their ancestors, Homo habilis? Um, and one of those is going to be a relatively thick cranium and a large brow ridge. But I actually, let me rephrase that. Um, these are primitive traits from Australopithecines, and it's actually kind of a blip in the evolutionary record that Homo erectus has a thicker cranium and a large brow ridge again. Um, and we think this is because of the fact that Homo erectus is really the first uh, true human to look like us, to be habitually bipedal, and to be incapable of living in the trees at night. So these creatures um, are living on the ground 
100% of the time, um, meaning that they're coming in contact with predators more and surviving bites to the skull by large um, canine and feline predators would have been a selective advantage. So we think that um, the, the cranium was thick and the brow ridge was thick among Homo erectus um, because uh, they needed that selective advantage in surviving attacks from other predators at the time. So some of the changing features among Homo erectus are found in the skull. Um, the brain case is getting longer as the brain is getting larger. Note that the average cranial size is now 1050, which is again another 40% increase uh, above the average in Homo habilis. The brain case is long and low, and it's widest at its base. So this Nagawi example, um, this uh, example of Nagawi gives you one. We see it's widest at its base compared to Homo sapiens, where we're widest at the temples, and it's very long. The cranium is very long, um, with reduced or minimal forehead overall. Homo erectus is also known to have um, what's called a sagittal keel. So the sagittal crest, remember, was a thick bony mohawk that Paranthropus had, a very derived trait no humans have. But Homo erectus has a slightly raised um, sagittal keel. So the bone on the very uh, superior portion of the skull is thickened, and this is called the sagittal keel. There is no real forehead um, for the most part, but there's a sloping behind the eye orbits and then a slight uh, forehead that slopes up behind the eyes. Notice, of course, that the postorbital constriction is reduced as well. There's still some, more than we'd see among a Homo sapien, but much less than any Australopiths or Homo habilis before it. So this is one of our Asian examples, um, Nagawi 1, long, low brain case, reduced post-orbital constriction, and obviously a much more centralized form in magna. This is indicative of our bipedal nature, um, and something's happening to Homo erectus that allows them now to have um, a greater amount of efficiency and endurance running abilities um, that you'll want to be familiar with for your quiz and for your lab. So notice that, um, so Homo erectus is our first endurance runner um, using energy efficiently. The arms are shorter. The chest has become much more narrow and the shoulders have lowered a little bit. We are taller and we have larger, more stabilized joints as well as a stabilized foot arch. These are the changes that we're seeing in Homo erectus's body that would have allowed them to run slowly, but for long periods of time. This is called endurance running. And it might be one of the reasons why Homo erectus was capable of traveling outside of Africa, um, these great distances to Indonesia and, and other um, East Asian locations. This is an African example that some people have said uh, is a separate species called Homo ergaster. Small brain comparatively to the average. Um, we have this brow ridge here, but it's not too thick. Um, you'll see an example of Homo ergaster. We have another one here, Turkana boy. That's 1.6 million years old. Um, this is a, a fascinating find and an amazing find because it was a nearly complete skeleton. Um, and you can see all those features we talked about with the uh, changes for endurance running. We have this narrow chest, the shoulders and the neck, or excuse me, the shoulders and clavicle are low from the skull. We have long legs. This was a boy um, at the age of nine that was five foot three inches tall, long legs, large joints, um, and stabilized foot arch. Um, so this is an interesting example that is African. Now, as we move out of Africa, we run into um, something that complicates our understanding of humans leaving Africa. So Homo erectus evolves in Africa about 1.8 to 2 million years ago, and they are in Java, Indonesia, 1.6 million years ago. That's less than 200,000 years to travel from East Africa to Southeast Asia. I know that sounds like a long period of time, but keep in mind that they're moving, you know, maybe a kilometer or so a day. And questions come up, of course, as to why we would have left Africa. And, and the answer is likely food. Um, we probably left in order to 
uh, follow our resources that we were taking advantage of. So herds of animals, let's say, or water resources as they changed. Um, and the original assumption was that it took tall, long, lean, intelligent Homo erectus to travel outside of Africa. But then right out of Africa, right outside of Africa in the country of Georgia, we ran into a problem. And the problem was another species of uh, Homo erectus, or potentially another species of Homo erectus, um, otherwise a regional version of Homo erectus found in Dimenisi, Georgia, sometimes referred to as Homo georgicus, 1.8 million years old, which means that as soon as Homo erectus traits appear in Africa, these traits are also appearing outside of Africa. And these uh, fossils really messed up the timeline for us a little bit. Um, they have very early homo features. They're short with a small brow ridge and some prognathism and large canines, a small brain, and they're using Oldowan tools similar to Homo habilis. Um, and yet they're out of Africa at 1.8 million years ago. They are, they have enough Homo erectus traits to be considered Homo erectus. They have that long, low brain case. You can see the lift of the sagittal keel here at the top of the skulls. And they have Homo erectus limb proportions. So because they are so distinct, some people have argued that they should be their own species, Homo georgicus. Others have argued that they're just simply a variation on Homo erectus. And if, if you think about our, our species and the variation we have, you know, two feet tall to seven feet tall and, you know, 60 pounds to 700, 800, 900, some people are 1,000 pounds, right, um, due to morbid obesity. So we have a great range of variation as well. It's up to you to decide um, whether you think these are distinctive species or variations on a single. This is an Indonesian example, Singirian 17, 1.2 million years old, um, large brow ridge, a long, more sloping forehead than we've seen before, slightly protruding mouth and a thick skull with that raising of the sagittal keel. You will have your own Asian, African, and then European examples. This is um, a, grand, uh, a juvenile from Grand Delina, uh, 780,000 years old. Some people have argued is so delicate delicate, um, that it is a subspecies of Homo erectus called Homo antecessor. Now, interestingly, Homo erectus does develop a newer, more advanced tool system. They're using old and one tools, but they're also developing the Acheulean tool technique, which is called biface or stone that's worked on both sides. Um, the primary tool that Homo erectus was using is called the Acheulean hand axe. This is a handheld object. Here's where the palm goes, and then you can see the thumb marks here as well. Um, it's slightly heavy, and it's perfectly shaped. Um, uh, kind of the, the vision in their head is pre-shaped into a teardrop shape with sharp uh, tips so that you can kind of come down, probably crack open bones to get bone marrow, which would fuel those increasingly larger brains. Um, so still a very primitive tool, but more advanced than we saw among the old one tool tradition. The materials used to make them were also transported longer distances. So this kind of suggests some cognitive advancement and forethought planning that they recognized that certain types of stone were better for this tool than others. So they would travel long distances more consistently to bring those um, uh, types of stone back. We do believe that these are still scavengers, not hunters, um, but they're definitely eating more meat. Um, and the hand axe would allow for the bone marrow inside the bones, and that's really rich in nutrients that would help fuel the large brain size that Homo erectus has. Homo erectus also appeared to have some kind of tenuous use of fire. They're likely cooking their food. Um, they're potentially dwelling inside caves. Um, they appeared to have survived major climate swings in China, so cold to hot temperature swings, um, and appear to have more complex social groupings and kinship, considering that the Dimenisi didn't really have a lot of the physical traits um, that we would expect it would take to travel these long distances and survive. 
we think that, um, you know, instead of those tall, long legs and intelligent brains being most important for long distance travel, that perhaps it's more intimate social groupings um, that allowed Homo erectus to travel because now they're caring for each other. Uh, more than they may have been in previous species. So obviously we're doing some speculating here, but we're certainly seeing advancing culture in the hand axe um, and a much wider range of diversity among the specimens that we're finding. So again, in your lab for early homo, you're going to be kind of deciding for yourself among these uh, specimens that I give you, um, how they should be categorized by first comparing their traits between the individual samples I give you and then making the decisions for yourself. Um, if you have any questions, of course, please always reach out. Otherwise, I look forward to meeting the archaic humans and ourselves in our next lecture.